safety. Our next session is titled The Six Steps to Success with First Party Data will be presented to you by Alistair Sheriffs. So please welcome Alistair Sheriffs. He's a VP of Marketing Growth at Property Finder. He's a 14-year expert. He has worked across several industries, both on the agency and the client side, managing iconic brands like Google. Alistair will share now the six foundational building blocks of a successful first party data strategy. Please welcome on stage, Alistair. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Um, hi everyone, big room. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Alistair Sheriffs. I'm the VP of Marketing and Growth at uh, Property Finder. For those of you who don't know who Property Finder are, we are the uh, leading property portal in the UAE. Uh, as well as a leading portal in Bahrain and Qatar, and hopefully to be the leading portal in Egypt and uh, Saudi as well. And yeah, I'm going to be talking today, let me get the clicker, about the building blocks to implementing a successful first party data strategy. Um, and I guess to get it out there first, what I've tried to do in this talk is to kind of talk about the directional things. Um, to try and give, I guess, kind of pointers and things you can work on in order to then kind of personalize and make this relevant to your business. Because, of course, every business is different in terms of the internal setup, in terms of the, uh, the kind of the vertical that you're in and what you specialize on. So I hope, you know, the takeaways from this will help you on your journey to it and, uh, and help you kind of make that journey a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. And I guess with that theme of trying to keep things fairly general and, and directional for you, We'll go on to uh, the, the, the first part, which is about selling the dream. And the second part will be about living the dream of, uh, of first party data. And the first most important, in my opinion, thing that you need to look about first is the idea of the pitch versus the reality. And a property finder, as we went on our journey, this really was kind of the cornerstone and where we spent the most time uh, when it came to planning first party data strategy, planning the technology partners we were going to work with as well as trying to work out how we are going to get from where we were to where we want to go. It's a journey we've started. It's a journey that we are on. It's not a journey that we, uh, that we have completed. And I imagine every single person in this room has read dozens and dozens of white papers, sat in vendor meetings, attended webinars that all talk about the idea of first party data, all sell the dream of what first party data will be. Okay. Um, but of course, the reality is very different to that. Okay. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's worse, it just means that it's different, okay? It might be a little bit less glossy. Um, it certainly wouldn't have been touched up in Photoshop uh, uh, beforehand. And to be very clear, having been on this journey for a while, it may well end up with you pulling your hair out and, and losing your hair. But it does not mean it's worse. What you have to understand is when we sit in these pitch meetings, when we read these webinars, when we read these white papers, they all kind of sell what's at the end result, what's the kind of the end state that you will be in, how does that benefit your business? And of course, that is kind of super, super important. But you need to realize that it's not your business. Um, we are a marketplace, and within that, we are a niche in the property uh, 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 specialization. And I haven't found one white paper or one webinar that specialized on first-party data strategy for property marketplaces in the Middle East, right? It's quite a niche, uh, niche subject and there'd probably be a fairly small audience for that, kind of, for that kind of session. So what we spent a very long time doing at Property Finder was really kind of breaking down all of those kind of end goals, all of those kind of famous use cases that we all kind of read about, whether that be you know, um, reducing media wastage or it be about personalization or it be about data privacy, uh, data privacy and, and, and consent. And working out really what does that mean to us as Property Finder? How can we take those and how can we apply those to us as a business? Um, and of course, the other thing that we think about, about first party uh, data strategies and, and you know, a property finder, we are kind of a, a technology driven business and we put technology at the heart of that first, uh, at the heart of that first party data strategy. The, um, the main thing to kind of really focus on is they focus on this is how easy it will be. Once it's all in place, once you're up and rolling, it's going to be really simple and you'll be able to achieve these great things and it's going to be running through, through meadows and there'll be rainbows and it'll be, and it'll be wonderful. But of course, what nobody can understand apart from you is how your own internal business runs. And that's what a lot of these things kind of miss out, kind of the difficulties that you have in terms of what's your internal kind of organizational structure? What are the priorities for your business? Who are the leaders in your company and what do they understand about data strategy and, and, and are they supportive of it? Okay. Um, so if anything you take away from today, I would really focus on this one. 
think about what your end goal is, buy into kind of those, 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 those end games that kind of we, we, we read about in white papers and we listen to in webinars, but take the time to really then break it down. Um, for example, when I was uh, working with Telium and onboarding and before we made the decision, I spent a lot of time in talking to existing clients they already had. And I think I spoke to maybe seven or eight different clients across the world, all of whom had implemented similar use cases to the ones we were looking to do. And I really spent, you know, like a good hour, two hours with some of these, uh, some of these people who were very generous with their time to kind of really dig into what were the problems you experienced, what were the bumps in the road that you, that you had. And that was incredibly beneficial because the last thing that you, we want to do, especially when you're going back internally and trying to do this, is to uh, over-promise and under-deliver. I think if you take time with this, with understanding you know, the end goal or the pitch versus the reality, then it means you can then move forward with confidence and with the right expect levels of expectations uh, within your own business. The second thing to think about is being uh, aware of the gatekeepers. And I'm kind of broadly lumping in decision makers and gatekeepers into this, of which when it comes to, um, to data strategy, there are a lot. So people in this room may have had experience kind of onboarding more niche marketing technologies that might be related to paid social or paid search. But when you're onboarding technologies that are in relation to your company's data strategy, of course, it's going to touch every single part of, the, uh, of your company, whether that be across kind of data or engineering, legal, uh, finance teams, and the product teams as well. Okay? Um, and the gatekeepers are many. They will be very unexpected. And a lot of the times they'll kind of pop out of nowhere when you kind of least expect them, okay? Um, you can spend a lot of time trying to uh, understand what it is they want and it can still kind of go wrong. And something that I would recommend doing, and this might seem a little bit extreme, but I would recommend you try it, is genuinely sitting down either with a whiteboard or with a piece of paper and a pad and, and kind of writing down who are all the people in, in, in your organization that are either decision makers uh, or, or gatekeepers. Um, what are their needs? What are their ambitions in the company? What are the problems that they currently have? And genuinely try and do that from a, 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 an empathetic point of view. Because what you'll soon start to learn is you'll start to kind of understand significantly better what the problems that your peers are trying to solve and how the solutions that you're trying to move towards can help them in, in, in what they're doing. Um, I say it does sound a little bit extreme, but it's something that we did and, and we revisited on, on, on a regular basis and it was incredibly helpful, um, especially in those times. And again, I'm sure most people in this room have had those meetings where it's a frustrating meeting. You know, you're, not, you're not meeting in the middle. You seem to be kind of avoiding uh, talking about certain things. If you've gone through this exercise, it will really help you kind of move through those conversations in a really positive way and kind of come out the other side um, uh, doing what's best for, the, for, for your business. And then the final thing which we did at Property Finder, um, which again I recommend, is we, um, we hired a specialist, right? Um, again, I had experience um, client side of onboarding niche technologies. I had experience vendor side from kind of advising companies on what marketing technologies they could use. But I personally had never overseen the integration of a kind of a company enterprise wide piece of technology that would touch all these various different parts. Um, and also, I wanted to kind of focus in on the strategic implications of, of first-party data and how it would benefit the business longer term. So we went out and we found somebody that had done this. And we were incredibly fortunate that we found somebody that had worked with Telium, who, who, who we were using, and had done so at a property portal, which they had done at REA in Australia. And, and we hired a head of marketing technology. And it was incredibly beneficial in these meetings with kind of decision makers and, and with gatekeepers to have somebody that could speak that technical language, that could sit there and understand potential bumps in the road and potential problems that would, uh, that would arise and had that experience. It kind of lent, um, I guess, credence to what we we're doing. It lent authority to the conversations that we were having. And again, I'd, I'd highly recommend either hiring somebody or ensuring you have somebody that specializes and will be focused on this kind of long-term project. So again, it's not going to be a one and done uh, uh, type of thing. Number three, enlist other people to convey the story for you. And this is, I guess, very basic behavioral uh, psychology, right? People are going to be much more likely to kind of support you and do things if they come to their own conclusions versus you sitting someone down and telling them, this is what we're going to do, this is why we're going to do it, and this is why it's, uh, it's, it's good for you. Um, and what it does is it brings people along on the, the journey for you. And things will always land better if somebody thinks that it's their own idea. Um, 
especially if you're coming, depending on what department you're in, you're pushing something like a first party data strategy, it can sometimes kind of get labeled, in my case, as you know, a marketing thing or just a growth thing. Whereas, of course, first party data is something that will impact every single part of your, of your business. And the implementation of the technology that will support that will touch significant parts uh, uh, of your business as well. Um, a couple of very uh, uh, clear examples I can give you is, um, and if there are any engineers in the room, I don't think I'm misspeaking, but often when you go to an engineer about something like a marketing technology, they'll say, why are we going to buy it when we can just build it ourselves, right? Uh, and that's a conversation that I've had <laughs> numerous times over the years. Um, and, and what I did was, you know, I sat the, you know, an, an engineering lead and a data lead in a room together, and I gave them all the information they needed so as they could go through a buy versus build comparison. Now, the dice were somewhat loaded because I'd already done this myself a few times and knew that buy would come out to win, which is what I wanted. But by kind of empowering and enabling my colleagues to go through this process themselves, they fully believed in it and they fully supported it. And then what I made sure is, is that those kind of decision makers and those influencers that had done this were then in the room when I was talking to this CFO, for example. So I don't then have to then tell this story. I've got an engineering lead and I've got a data lead who are already kind of supportive and, and talking about why it's best for business uh, and, why, and why it makes sense. Another example was kind of talking at length with kind of the legal teams in our company about kind of all the things that have been happening in Europe and the States with GDPR, the, the legal implications of consent and why it was so important to us as a business. You know, timely, you know, a couple of days ago in the kind of the, in the top 50 things announced, they've announced that we are going to have in the UAE kind of a specific kind of data law that's incoming. You know, it's been written in Egypt and it will be landing in a year. It, it already exists in Qatar and Bahrain. Um, so again, educating and eliciting all of my peers to kind of support it was an incredibly powerful thing to do. And again, hopefully you'll understand that these things I'm talking about are chronological. So if you spend time with the kind of the gatekeepers and the decision makers, doing this next should kind of flow quite, uh, quite naturally. Okay, so we've done the first three parts. We've sold the dream internally. People are supportive of our first party data strategy. They understand that we want technology at the heart of it and, and that's what you need to do. Now kind of comes the difficult bit, which is actually delivering on what you've said, right? Because you spent a lot of time kind of selling it in, making it sound like it's gonna be amazing. Being realistic though, remember, it's always better to, 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 um, to uh, over deliver rather than over promise. But now you need to actually get it done. Um, and, and this is where things can get pretty tricky. And the first thing to really think about is, is hearts and minds. If you think about what I was talking about uh, before in terms of decision makers and gatekeepers, that's kind of like a top-down approach, right? You're trying to engage those key influences within your company to make sure they're supportive of the journey that you're going on. But in reality, they're not the ones that will be implementing it. In reality, I'm not the person that's implementing it hands-on. It's kind of all the engineers and the product managers and the data engineers that are kind of doing a lot of that heavy lifting uh, for you. Um, so again, you really need to invest time in this. Because again, people are going to commit and work a lot harder on what you're doing if they believe uh, on what you're doing and they understand why you're doing it. And, and when I say hearts and minds, what I really mean is negotiation, right? Um, you know, product managers, engineers, data engineers, they're working quarter to quarter based on kind of priorities that are set from, from a top-down point of view. It's much easier to go into those kind of planning sessions and have, again, your friends in engineering, your friends in product, your friends in data say, hey, what about um, you know, the data layer that we're going to be changing and moving over to Telium IQ? We need to make sure that's on our list of priorities rather than you sitting in that meeting and having to remind everybody and having to, to, to push it as, as, as much as you possibly can. Be warned, this is probably the toughest part of anything that we've done. Um, you have to be incredibly consistent. You have to kind of be incredibly kind of persuasive. You have to think of all different ways to communicate with all these different people. Because again, different people have different priorities. What you think is important, other people don't necessarily think is important. But again, spending time with this means that across what is going to be quite a long journey, you'll have consistent support. You're not going to get to your end goal within one quarter. It's going to be a six, 12, even 18 month process. And winning hearts and minds, having constant negotiation as you're going on, again, will ease that process and make it a lot easier for you to keep up the consistency and keep up um, uh, uh, kind of the small victories along the way. And plans will fail. Um, as with any kind of project, things will go wrong. Um, we were on day three of uh, an in-person training with Telium. Uh, we'd signed the contract, we're about to go kind of all in, um, we had kind of the next two quarters planned out to do it, and on the fourth day of training, the trainer had to leave and cancel the training to get on a plane to fly back to the UK, because they were genuinely scared they might not be let in because of the explosion of COVID, right? 
we couldn't mitigate for that. And all the changes that then came thereafter set us back quite a way. Obviously, the priorities of the company changed. We went from let's onboard uh, you know, a, a CDP and let's focus on first party data strategy to saying, how can we help our clients with viewings in a time where everybody's locked down and can't leave their houses, right? Sadly as well, people left the business. That was something that I think affected most businesses in the, in, in the region. So we had to kind of go back up a few stages in order to, uh, in, in order to kind of restart the influencing, restarting the hearts and minds and, and, and restart kind of uh, decision makers. Um, and certainly you won't see problems happening or you won't see them coming. Uh, you know, a, a lead engineer who's a big fan of what you're doing, fully understands it, is fully bought into the technology, may suddenly leave. And then there's some, suddenly somebody new in the team that, that you need to kind of convince and, and, and take on that journey again. But again, if you've done these steps chronologically, it shouldn't be too hard for you to kind of go back up a couple, reuse some of the things that you've already learned and reuse some of the things that have already been successful in order to keep the momentum uh, going. Uh, and the last thing, which again, I think if you could take away two things, it would be the first point around kind of uh, the, uh, the, the pitch versus the reality. And it would be this one, which is the consistent delivery. Um, an old boss of mine a few years ago kind of posed the question to me once of how do you eat an elephant? All right. And of course, the answer is elephant burgers. So you can't eat an elephant in one sitting. You have to chop it up into little pieces and, uh, and, and have it in burgers, right? And when we're talking about something like data strategy, where we have these kind of very long term kind of big, ambitious end goals, they're not going to be delivered again until maybe three, six, 12 months in your journey. And the people that sit on your exec board, the people that, 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 that kind of give, you know, own the purse strings, they're not really happy if you're going to be like, no, no, it's another six months, and then you're going to see a return on your investment. You need to wait another three months, actually, because we had a bit of a problem with, uh, with an engineer leaving. They want to see consistent um, uh, delivery. And things that you deem as being quite small, if you package them up in the right way and you present them back into the business, they can be seen as kind of successes. Um, it could be as simple as when you're doing a full audit of your data layer and the events on your website, you see that you haven't necessarily got best practice in place or you're firing events that aren't actually tracking anything or there might be a certain error in your, in your, in your data and the reporting that your business analytics team are using. That's a victory and you should celebrate that and, and, and sell it back into the business uh, as such. The one thing I will say and the one piece of advice I will give on this uh, is try and, try, try and tie everything back to a dollar amount. The amount of times I've stood in front of uh, kind of you know my C-suite team or people in the finance team and proudly announced the amazing operational efficiency of something that we've discovered, just to have them staring back at me blankly, uh, is it, being quite numerous. Because ultimately they want to understand: have we saved money or has it made us some money? How has it impacted the bottom line of the business? So I'd really encourage you to always try and tie these kind of little victories back to something that's either driving something that's a core focus for your business, whether it be at an OKR level or try and tie it back to some kind of kind of a, a dollar value. Um, cool, so just to summarize, selling the dream, three key points, and then living the dream, three key points. As I say, hopefully these are kind of not too specific, but they're directional enough that you can take some of these, apply them to your own business, and, and kind of really help drive forward that first party data strategy with technology uh, at the heart. Um, and I've um, uh, got a few minutes left, so if anybody has any questions, then please let me know. Thank you, Alastair, so much for this power packed session, and I really love the six steps. They were really effective. Thank you, and please give a big round of applause to Alastair. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, so our... Are there any questions at all in the yeah. room? Anyone? Sure. If any questions, please raise your hand or just speak up. Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, if there's any questions, just a, I guess a final thing. Um, my friends at Telium are giving away uh, an iPad. So if you uh, want to enter for that, just make sure you pass by their stall and get your badge scanned. You can't scan it more than once, I've tried. Um, so you can only enter once. But if, uh, if you're interested in that, then pop by, say hello to them and, uh, and, and enter for that. Thanks.